My name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, the Karayan won. I almost <laughs> rendezvoused with Kerbin Station here in Low Kerbin Orbit, but unfortunately ran out of fuel uh, only 30 meters per second short, so we had to send out one of our crew uses to go out and rescue our four brave Kerbinats returning back from the moon. We also had to pick up Wilman's debris here to help us finish off a contract. And so uh, the Kuryus is now just about getting itself back to Kerbin Station. And while it's doing that, we'll talk about what else is coming up in this particular episode. As I talked about last episode, I have a total of 12 Kerbals in space right now. And I came up with this plan to get them all back down to the surface. So my first job is going to be to start to get uh, some of these Kerbals down to the surface. So we'll start off with uh, Bill and Carol and Wilman that we see here, get them down to the surface. And then we'll also move on to Bob, Luya, and Krisnik, who are currently in Kerbin Station. And that will leave six more to get down to the surface. Unfortunately, uh, four of those are rather heavily involved. They're in a mission around Minmus. I got Gilly Kerman on the surface of Minmus needing to get rescued. And I have three other Kerbals out there performing the jobs, Svetlana, Glafia, and Carol, if I'm not mistaken. But we'll find out when we get there. So they're not coming back for a little bit just yet. And in fact, we will be visiting them a little later on in this episode as they get ready to perform that rescue off of Minmus's surface. Also coming up in this episode, we'll be visiting Duna 1, which is about to make a correction burn on its way out to Duna. Uh, this was launched quite some time ago, so if you've forgotten about it, I don't blame you, but you'll be seeing it again this episode. And, oh, the aforementioned uh, transfer to 1.12, uh, that will also be happening this episode, and I'm going to be, at that time, installing some uh, beautification mods, taking a bit of advantage of the extra RAM afforded by... Uh, the 64-bit version of Kerbal Space Program, so there's something to look forward to. But right now, um, yeah, I, I, my docking port on the Kuryus here is completely obscured by uh, Wilman's capsule that's stuck there on the top. So we're going to have to send out Bartner here to do a little bit of work before we can uh, dock with this. So we'll just bring this to a stop, and then we'll uh, we'll get Bartner, Bartner out there, and we'll get him doing some work using... Uh, little bit of KAS. Bartner, of course, is our engineer assigned to Kerbin Station. And I'm pretty sure that I have uh, a couple of the small 0.625 meter docking ports around here somewhere. So we'll check these inventory containers. Okay, that one's empty. <laughs> so it's clearly not there. Check this one out. And look inside. Oh, there we are. Yes, we have ourselves some docking ports. So big one that fits into his inventory. Two is going to be too big. Okay, why don't we lose this EVA mono, extra monoprop container? Still too big. Oh, man, why do I have so much junk? partner has got two drills. He's got two KAS instruction manuals. Clearly, he does not need any of that information. Okay, why don't we, uh, we'll do. He's not going to be able to get that other docking port into his inventory anyway. It's too, he's, it's, it's too much for him to carry both of those. But what we'll do is we'll get down to the larger inventory container that I have down here. And we'll get rid of this extra equipment that I have for some reason. By the way, while I'm playing with this, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, experimenting with the camera view. In the settings, you can change the default camera view. So I have the camera set so that it's free. It doesn't just lock itself onto the Kerbal's back. Which makes, I think, for some more interesting shots. But it is a little more awkward to maneuver your Kerbal, that's for sure, on EVA. Not really sure if I like it yet. But, uh, no, in fact, I'm pretty sure I'm going to switch it back. This is a little bit too awkward, but this is pretty simple. Okay, let's get rid of this drill and get rid of this extra uh, KAS manual. Man, how many drills? I got five drills down there. Why? 
what what on earth am I doing with so much stuff? Oh, well, whatever. Okay. All right, Bartner, let's get down there. What we'll do is we will attach that one docking port in around the middle of this big orange tank here. That'll be nice and out of the way. And then we'll stick Wilman's debris onto that. And then we'll be able to dock the Kuryu's normally. There we go. That ought to do it. And now we just got to go back up and get that other docking port. There we go. All right. And now we'll uh, put this one onto Wilman's debris so we can do the docking. And Wait, what's going on with uh, Bartner here? Oh, dear. Bartner has clearly lost it. Dan Bartner. He's only 19 days into his current mission. Uh, that's not too long to go a little space happy like that. Now, to be fair, actually, Bartner is my second most space experienced Kerbinaut. This is his 120th day in space. And the person that's got him beat is Bill, who is actually currently in the Kuryu's. He's at 148 days in space, 120 consecutive days in space, in fact. In fact, him coming back right now is his 120th consecutive day in space. So uh, these two engineers are certainly uh, setting the bar high as far as space time goes. Anyway, it was no problem putting that docking port on the end of Woman's capsule and then docking it onto the station. And then I wanted to take advantage of the fact that this white orbital module on the top of the Kuryu's is a laboratory. So I used my scientist to start generating some scientific data using the science that was collected from our moon mission. We have actually quite a bit of science that was collected from the moon because I did land some folks down there on the surface to collect some science. And so we're just generating the laboratory data now. Unfortunately, I do not have a lab module on this station. That's been kind of an on-again, off-again type of mission. I keep trying to put a lab module on this and then I just keep getting other things that I need to do. But uh, So what I did is I generated as much scientific data as I could using this orbital module and the orbital module that's on the other Kuryu's as well that's identical to this one. Uh, and then I just separated. I left the orbital module attached to the station with the idea that when I finally do get a permanent lab module up here, I'll be able to transfer all that scientific data over to the lab module, get some scientists up here and get them to work. But I don't want to lose that data, so I'll just leave that there. The orbital module, by the way, normally, of course, does get, just burns up in the atmosphere. So this is a, sort of a waste not, want not situation. So, uh-oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> I just tried to put on the SAS and it didn't go on. Because I have two engineers and a scientist in my descent module, I left Tamley in the station because I want her, uh, she's not going to be leveling up, so I thought I'd just leave her in space. Um, and the, I do have a probe body normally on the Kuryu's, but the probe body is attached to the orbital module that I just left behind. So I have no SAS. Well, this could be fun. Alright, we can do it. Two engineers and a scientist, of course we can do it. Okay, let's let's get rid of this. Whoa, spinning around. I love the way those cables come off of that module. See them floating away. That's awesome. Okay, okay. We don't need SAS anymore. We're in the atmosphere. This thing naturally wants to uh, orient itself in a retrograde direction, so we'll just let atmospheric physics do the work for us. And speaking of atmospheric physics, it turned out that uh, not having a pilot was actually the least of... Uh, my worries with this. Uh, do you remember last episode where I had some issues with the drag on a inline parachute? It ended up costing a launch of a new satellite. Um, it turned out that the uh, drag model saw the parachute as being semi-deployed all the time, whether it was being deployed or not. Well, guess what? This particular capsule has the exact same parachute. And I started to get actually pretty worried up here because uh, it's like, well, is it going to heat it like it's deployed? Because if it does, uh, I could end up losing this parachute and losing this crew, and that would be obviously very unfortunate. Fortunately, it didn't work that way. Uh, it was heating it as if it were not deployed, though uh, the drag was still, as it was, semi-deployed. So you can see here, 
uh, it is losing velocity quickly, even though we're still fairly high in the atmosphere. Um, but although it took them a while to get down, they did eventually get down. So once down, I discovered that I only had 2.2 science. I'm not sure what happened, but none of the surface science from the moon is here. So that's really kind of weird. I'll have to do a search. Hopefully I didn't lose it. However, everybody did level up. So that is a good thing. And with that accomplished, why don't we get ourselves out to interplanetary space between Kerbin and Duna, where Duna 1 is getting ready to perform a correction burn. And even though it's 146 days since it was launched, it's still another 165 days until we get to Duna so this is still a while yet to get there, but I'm just playing around with very minor correction burn. And I'm just using the radial, let's get the prograde off. I'm just using the radial component really to sort of sweep back and forth. What I'd love to get is an Ike encounter before I get to Duna. But unfortunately, you can see right here, uh, Ike is not positioned right. It'll get to Duna first and then it'll get to Ike, that big moon of Duna. If I could get Ike first, I could have gotten... Um, a bit of a gravity assist off of Ike to try and slow myself down to make my capture around Duna a little bit easier, but that isn't in the card. So what I'm going to be doing instead is just bringing my periapsis nice and low. And then we'll use the remote tech flight computer to execute the node. See, I still got that bit of wobble. Really, I don't, I don't, I think it must just be the reaction wheels overcompensating. Not too bad in this particular case. I do want to draw attention to my signal delay. My signal delay is now up to 11 seconds. We are 11 light seconds away from Kerbin now. So that's how long it takes for commands to go there. You really should be twice that, right? Because in order to put a command, it has to go out to the vessel, and then there has to be a return before you realize what has happened. It really should be twice 11, but it is what it is. Anyway, there goes our burn. And that's it. Like I said, just a little guy. Here, we'll put this on the normal vector. Take away that. And let's see what our result is here. Scroll out. Oh, oh I got Ike. It doesn't matter. Let's focus the view and see what we have. There is our trajectory. I don't see a periapsis. No, it looks like I'm actually just barely hitting Duna. That's okay. In fact, it's, it's more than adequate. Uh, I don't think I need to tweak this again until we're into Duna's sphere of influence. But like I said, that's going to be 165 days from now. So we'll set up an alarm. But then we got to get to other things. One of those other things, going back to Kerbin Station. Getting three more Kerbals down to the surface. While I'm here, I'm checking for that missing science looking in all the various command modules, and I see no sign of it. I mean, the scientific data is there, the data that was generated uh, from the science, but the science itself is gone. Now, generating data shouldn't use up the science unless something has changed recently, but I don't think so. I mean, that doesn't make any sense that it would use up that scientific data. I mean, doing the laboratory research is sort of a dubious benefit anyway. I mean, the rate at which you generate science is pretty slow. And if they made it that it actually used up the science you collected, that would make it, I think, completely not worth your time at all. It would be actually a negative to do it. I don't know. I'm not sure what happened, but I'm not going to worry about it. i got some stuff to do, though, before we bring our Kerbals down. i got to play a little bit with some docking ports. Um, I do have a mission to come up here and get Willman's capsule and bring that down to the surface to finish off that particular contract. But to do that, I need to do a little bit of shuffling, get this uh, orbital module off of Willman's capsule. So I need to put a docking port on it to do that. So I thought I would take the docking port off of this docking hub and, oh, oh dear. Okay, well, as you see, we got uh, Bartner and Krisnik out here working outside the station. <laughs> I think they just broke something. Um, that cylindrical piece is one of those uh, structural fuselages. It should have an end to it. It shouldn't be a hollow tube. That is really weird, but I'll have to deal with that later. Um, right now, I'm going to take this docking port. We're going to put it at the end of this orbital module. 
so that we can use one of the other crew uses to move it uh, back up to one of our free docking ports and that will leave the uh, Willman's capsule to be picked up in a later mission. And then once that's accomplished, I'll take this docking port back off of this orbital module and try to put it back where it belongs, see if we cannot fix the damage our two engineers just did. You might notice in this too that um, something's up with the portraits down there at the bottom right. Uh, I got that uh, snowy image for Krisnik. He's not in this vessel. In fact, he is perfectly fine. He's hanging on to the outside of the station right now. Um, I, I don't know what's going on. So I just want to let you know I didn't lose a Kerbal. He's, he's perfectly fine, but for some reason, I don't know, those uh, portraits down there at the bottom right are a little bit messed up. Anyway, uh, once this was accomplished, it was time to see if we cannot fix the hole I just put into my station. All right, partner, let's see what we can do here. And, ooh, that's not... Uh oh, it doesn't want to go in the center of the hole. It's either clicking to the side of the tube or right there at the bottom of the hole where obviously none of this is going to, oh dear. Oh dear, wait a sec, wait a sec. I think I have somewhere kicking around one of these uh, flat adapters that I ripped off of something. Yeah, Bernard, let's get down there. If it's here, it's going to be in this uh, the big storage chest down here, the big storage container. Okay, open this up. Oh, uh, yep, there it is, right there. Oh my gosh, it's a good thing I'm a hoarder. Does that fit? Oh, and it fits into Bartner's inventory. Excellent. Okay, what I'm hoping is that I can stick this onto the end, that it'll go on better than the docking port will, and then I can put the docking port onto that. Let's, let's see how this goes. All right, trying again here. Okay, oh, well, oh, not still. Oh, oh, there, there. Okay, I think, I think this is gonna work. Uh, let's get the docking port ready. Whoops. Let me we'll open up this inventory. Yeah, I do have my docking port ready and, oh, just one last try to make sure that you know, it mustn't have something to do with the way my Kerbal was positioned. No, this is not going to stick on the end of here. Give it up. Okay, let's put that on. Come on, do it again. There. And attach. Yes! Okay, and now we'll put the docking port hopefully onto this. Oh, it went blue. I saw it. Let's see if we can get this lined up. Right in the center. I don't think this is going to be perfect, but I want to make it look as good as I can. And attach. Yeah, it'll do. It'll work. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, let's get these guys down. And aboard this Curious, we have Bob and Luya and Krisnik, leaving Tamley and Bartner aboard this station. Remember, I still do have the Corian 2, which is currently in orbit around Minmus, to complete its mission and get on back so I thought I'd leave a pilot and an engineer behind in case they got themselves into any kind of trouble and by the way I should also explain after my little bit of an adventure that I showed you with that radio or that inline parachute that comes from homegrown rockets um, I did a little bit investigating trying to nail down what exactly is the issue with this thing and it turned out it's a conflict between it and real shoots so what I did is the simplest, I just simply took real shoots out. Sorry, real shoots, uh, I just <laughs> removed real shoots. It's no longer part of this particular game. I tested the radio parachutes and once the real shoots was removed, it was perfectly fine. So uh, this guy descended without any issues whatsoever, ever completely normally. And it was after I got these guys down to the surface safely that I posted my previous episode, which actually spawned a really good uh, comment discussion from that particular video. And it was that discussion in the comments that convinced me that I shouldn't have to wait. I'm not going to wait until I got all my Kerbals back down to the surface before going to 1.1.2. Uh, I'm going to do it right now. Okay, so it's just after sunset and I know it's dark, but uh, just bear with me. I'm going to shut up for just a second. Yeah, we are now in version 1.1.2, though that is not what's contributing the most to the extra awesomeness of this particular launch. 
Now I've decided to step up my mods a little bit with the extra performance that are coming out now with 1.1 and my previous standard mods that you've been seeing a lot of seeming to work fine. I think it was time to step this up. So installed now is environmental visual enhancements. That's giving uh, the city lights that you can just see off there on the horizon. It's also going to be adding clouds to curb and, and other things that you will be seeing well soon enough throughout this particular series. In fact, I had environmental visual enhancements installed uh, for the first 30 or 35 episodes of this series. But I ended up uninstalling it when it started affecting my... to try and get my frame rate to come up, really. Oh, we're coming to booster separation. Oh, I should mention this is simulation mode uh, until testing this thing. So that was less than, uh, less than clean. So anyway, yeah, environmental visual enhancements, something you've seen before, but not what you haven't seen before is what is giving me those engine sounds and engine plumes. This is real plume. It's a mod that I have been admiring for some time, but uh, haven't been installing because, uh, well, again, uh, performance limitations really being it. Uh, but now, oh, look at that. And what it does, and something that actually has always sort of bothered me a bit about Kerbal Space Program, is that it modifies the engine plume based upon uh, atmospheric pressure. And you can see that the engine plume is starting to change, it's starting to expand. And that's because the pressure as we go up in the atmosphere is starting to uh, decrease. And so the way in which the plume behaves is very, very different as we get lower and lower pressure. Something that's always kind of bugged me in KSP that the engine plumes always looked exactly the same no matter where you were, whether you were at sea level, whether you're in a vacuum, didn't make any difference. Now it does, and I really, really like it. I am having some frame rate issues. Uh, I would like to get the frame rate up a little bit, but they do give you some utilities for adjusting the number of particles in that plume. So uh, I'm going to play with this a little bit, see if I can get the frame rate up a little bit higher. We're coming out to another engine separation here, another booster separation. Yeah, still some work to be done. <laughs> but that's okay again, this is just testing. And by the way, this vehicle, this vehicle is my laboratory module for my space station. Um, this has been an on-again, off-again mission. You actually saw this explode on the pad back in episode 66. That kind of scrubbed that mission. I redesigned it, obviously, a little bit after that. That was only a day or two from being built when I made my decision that, you know what, uh, I'm going to get rid of TAC life support. This thing had a lot of TAC life support in it, so I scrapped it out of the building queue. And... Uh, now it's back again. I'm testing. I'm going to put it back into the building queue. Back, by the way, what I was just doing right there was playing around a little bit with uh, the number of particles in that plume, trying to see if I can improve the frame rate. I also think I'll turn down the aerodynamic effects, uh, see if that can help with the frame rate. To be fair, this thing is actually quite a vessel, it, uh, a lot of parts. It's, uh, it was 159 parts at launch, so this isn't exactly, um, this is a, above average launch, I would say. Oh my gosh, look at that plume, that's gorgeous. I love it. Okay, anyway, yeah, the lab module is back now, and the big reason is because while I was in the process of updating KSP, I made the decision, despite what I was saying last episode, that I'm not going to get rid of TAC life support just yet. Same thing with remote tech. I'm going to hang on to them for a little while. Last episode, I talked quite a bit about Kerbalism, but looking at things a little bit more closely, reading about some other people's experiences with it, I'm going to hold on just a little bit, just a little bit, hang on. And even if I do update and go to Kerbalism, um, I'm going to keep the TAC life support and remote tech parts in the game. There's no reason for me to get rid of them. I got the extra RAM now. I, can, I, I don't have to worry about part count and that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, I just wanted you to take a look at that real plume. I really love it, but I think it's time to get out of simulation mode and into something that is really happening. Well, relatively really happening. <laughs> I do know this is a video game. Uh, this is the Kegel 3 high above Minmus. I've already gotten my capture, but I want to uh, take a moment, show you the skybox. Uh, this is actually my new old skybox. This is the skybox I started the game with and uh, got rid of at the same time I got rid of environmental visual enhancements sometime 
I don't know, episode 30 to 35, somewhere in there. And then I thought, yeah, let's bring it back. And looking at it now, I don't know why I ever got rid of it. I really, really like it. I think it's quite, quite pretty. Anyway, we are on our way, way, way above Minmus to perform a 125 degree inclination change so that we will be in the same plane as Minmus Station, which we need to rendezvous with. And of course, we all know plane changes are best made when you are far away from the object about which you are orbiting. And there we go. And now, once we get back down to Periapsis, of course, we are ready to perform our rendezvous burn. And as we perform this burn, we can get ready to sort of tweak our encounter here. I want to show you something that I discovered. I was complaining a couple of episodes ago that with 1.1, you could no longer click on the nodes and orbital indicators and have them show you their readouts. You had to hover over them. That's not true. Uh, you don't click on them. You right click on them now. And, and everything counts. You can do it on uh, ascending and descending nodes. And right here, I'm going to do it on the closest approach indicator and that data stays there so that makes it really helpful for me to uh, fine tune this encounter so I don't have to hover it over with the mouse and I'm just using uh, the main engines the liquid fuel and oxidizer engines because I do have monoprop but the, the only monoprop I have is in the command capsule and it's just for docking so I want to save it I'm gonna try and get this down as low as it will go oh, oh that's that's looking pretty good there, about, yeah, I'm under half a kilometer. That will definitely do. Okay, and now all we got to do is ride this around a single orbit, get in nice and close to Minmus Station so that we can dock with it. Yeah, that new feature of being able to have the data from these close approach indicators always there without hovering the mouse over it is just great. Okay, we're getting pretty close. So why don't we just cut ahead a little bit closer to the station the Kegel 3, of course, is going to be our lander for rescuing Gilly off of the surface of Minmus. It's also going to haul up her Mark II cockpit that she has down there. i got to get that back to curb and surface as well. So uh, it's actually been specially designed so that uh, the cockpit will fit underneath there. I'm going to use a little bit of KAS struts and pipe endpoints to, uh, to uh, get it attached there. And here you can sort of see I got a bit of the remote tech wobble happening. Seems to be the worst in around Minmus. It's kind of interesting. When I'm closer to Kerbin, it's not there. And when I get further away from Kerbin, like you saw with Duna 1 earlier in this episode, it doesn't seem to be so bad. But right around Minmus, it seems to be this wor the worst, this sort of, this kind of wobble. But, oh well. Anyway, uh, speaking of remote tech and also tech life support, now that I am not going to be... At the very least, ooh, new docking alignment indicator interface. Very nice. Okay, sorry. Uh, what was it? Oh, yeah, I was talking about uh, that I won't be uninstalling remote tech and TAC life support. At least I'll be keeping the parts, which means that all of these vessels will remain viable. Uh, that was the reason why I was recalling all of my Kerbals, because uh, all of these vessels that I have in space that are housing my Kerbals, I'll have TAC life support, of course, incorporated into them. And once TAC life, those parts were gone, those vessels would have been gone as well. Um, but I'm deciding that I'm not going to do that after all. So the recall has been recalled. <laughs> I'm not going to be recalling my Kerbals. Uh, unfortunately, I did uh, bring down a few more than I needed to, so I'm going to have to be getting some back up into space. And the Korion 1, which we abandoned last episode, is still in low Kerbin orbit, floating about completely devoid of fuel, but completely serviceable as well. So we'll have to put together a salvage mission and get that vessel up and going once again. That, of course, will have to be for a future episode. And looking at the time that we're at, I think also the rescue of Gilly Kerman. That's going to have to be for the beginning of the next episode. So next episode, we will get the Kegel 3 here all ready to go down to the surface of Minmus and see if we cannot get Gilly and her Mark II cockpit off of the surface and back here to the station and start our journey back home. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you again next time.